when you multitask now this is interesting you are less efficient and you are prone to errors and i don't i, I expect that you are not going to believe me so please join me in one small test it's going to take you about two minutes and it is incredibly insightful so in your workbooks you will find this test we are going to do the same thing twice so you see there are three lines in here on the first line you're going to write capital letters from a to o so a b c d e f and so on and so forth. on the second line you are going to write odd numbers from 29 to 1 in decreasing so 29 27 25 and so on and on the third line you will draw a small triangle circle and a square and triangle circle and a square and if you are if you count you will see that you need to write actually 15 letters 15 numbers and you're going to create five times triangle circle square so 15 symbols and we are going to do that twice first time just write first all the letters then all the numbers then all the symbols and you will write here on the bottom line time that it took you to do that job i'm going to wait for you and i'm going uh, well, we are going to have a counter here somewhere <laughs> So just when we say go, you will do that and then you see how much time has passed. But it is about, I don't know, 30, 40, maybe 50 seconds. It is not going to take much time. Then we are going to repeat that test. But you will write one letter, one number, one symbol. And another letter, another number, another symbol. So A29 triangle b 27 circle c 25 square and so on and then, then we can try and square and so on and then we will see how much time do you need to do that one first job second job third job or by doing a little bit of first a little bit of second a little bit of third and not a little bit of third a little bit of second a little bit of third we'll see is really multitasking faster okay so get ready i just need to prepare my clock okay ready and first you are going to write all the letters all the numbers and triangle circle square triangle circle square triangle circle square five times okay you understand each other okay great ready set go You have a clock here, so you don't have to worry about time. Okay. You're probably at the line of the symbols now. But don't worry, you're not competing with anyone. We're just competing with yourself. So we want to see how you are dealing with being in multitasking mode. Don't worry about being faster than the other guy. Okay, that should do it. Everybody finished? Okay. Okay, let's leave it for a few seconds just to get to a full minute. Great. So you wrote that. You saw what time it took you. Okay, write that time downstairs. Now, we are going to do the same thing again. But this time, you will write one letter, A, one number, 29, one symbol. Another letter, another number, another symbol. Ready, set, go! Oh, come on, do it faster. 
But we don't care all day, come on. <laughs> I mean, you're saying that multitasking is making you more efficient, so please prove it. Okay, faster, faster. Oh, come on, come on. Just d d don't, don't look at where you were or the previous session. Just do it the best as you can and as fast as you can. Go, 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 go. Give it some speed, give it some speed, give it some speed. Come on, we don't have enough, enough time. <laughs> We need to do that quickly. <laughs> I'm kind of like your drill sergeant or boss, you know, making you additional stress. Go, 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 go. You didn't finish, you didn't finish. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. This should be more than enough time for you. No? Is it? Are you already at the number three or maybe at the number one? Okay. Everybody finished? Everyone finished? <laughs> okay, that should be enough. Now, write that time that you really need it. Is it faster or is it slower? <laughs> well, <laughs> usually it is about 30 or 50 percent slower. In some extreme cases, it is double. You, when you multitask, you need to actually. Uh, not to sound sexist, but women are better at multitasking than men. So, I don't expect that any of you ladies needed twice the time. It was about 30 seconds, 30 percent or 50 percent. For men, it usually is from 50 percent to double. Because, you know, women are just wired to handle multitasking better, but take a look at that. Now, I'm not going to put on this video your results. I don't want to embarrass you, but I have no problem embarrassing myself. So what I want to show you is my test. And then first I wrote the first test and it took me 43 seconds. And then in the second attempt, it was 64 seconds. So it is 50%, I'm a male. <laughs> but I was a bit disappointed because I noticed that I usually when you do in a multitasking mode, it is less neat. It is messy. Is it, is it messier in, in your example? Just compare this first with this second. Is it messier? Yes, it is. Okay. But I didn't make any mistakes. <clears throat> and that's actually what I wanted you to prove. That when you create something out of your multitasking mode, that you do it not as good, not as neat, and also that you are prone to mistakes. And I was a bit disappointed because I didn't make any mistakes. But then suddenly it dawned to me, I mean, this line ends with O. And this second attempt ends with N. Well, maybe I missed something, and then <laughs> I realized that I doubled the letter L. So I made a mistake. <laughs> so, point taken, <laughs> I hope. We are all multitasking, and we are convinced that we are more efficient. Actually, you are not. Actually, you are not. When you multitask, you are prone to errors. You don't do your job as good as when you are completely focused on that. And if you don't have enough time in your life, it means that you are wasting your time. You're wasting your time by worrying that you don't have enough time. And that is one heavy task in your mind that's pulling your resources from the things that really should be done. If you have five things to do, do a task list. Choose what is the most urgent thing or the most important thing to do. And then do that first with your full attention. Then go to the second. Then go to the third. Of course, that doesn't mean that you are going to ignore phone call from your client or from your boss because, you know, I must focus on this email. You will. But you stop doing writing your email, and then you take a deep breath, 
and you get your full attention to that phone call. Otherwise, what's going to happen? You're writing an email while talking to someone here and then waiting your colleague to bring you these papers and then the colleague brings you the wrong papers and you have no idea what you just negotiated with that guy on a client and you send his name into an email and you create a mess and now you need to fix it. And you are wasting your time. Be present. Do one things one by one, and that is going to give you more time. You are going to create more time by being more attentive and more focused on the things that are in front of you. And not just that, when you realize that you are observer of all situations, you are going to be able to handle them in a much more efficient way. So, for example, one morning you're getting ready for work and you have open laptop on your kitchen desk. And you move for one minute. Just for one minute, maybe you will go to the toilet. And when you get back, you suddenly realize that your two or three year old son has decided to put some peanut butter on your laptop screen. <laughs> well, that's it, the situation, right? And now you have a choice. Of course, you are going to get angry or frustrated or whatever. Maybe even guilty because you left your valuable equipment that you need in just a minute, you're packing to go to your office, so you need that laptop. You cannot take that laptop with that peanut butter on the screen with you to your office. So, time you don't have. Now you have it even less. But there is a choice. If you allow yourself to get angry, you will scream at your kid. And then your kid will start crying. And then your husband will come to see what's happening. And then you need to explain to your husband what's happening. And you need to calm your kid down because now he is crying. He feels guilty. But he's not guilty. I mean, he didn't understand what he's doing. It was just a game for you, for him. <laughs> Instead, you can notice, you can notice that you are getting angry and take a deep breath and just clean that up. Cleaning up is about a minute or two, maybe three. Getting into all that drama will take you 20 minutes, half an hour, and then you will go to your work, to your office, feeling guilty because you made your kid cry for actually no reason at all. You could have handled that differently. Or guilty because your husband now needs to stay at home a little bit further, so maybe he will be late to work. And of course you're sad. Because, you know, that beautiful innocent creature, your kid, is now sad and you made that because you were not aware enough. You were not conscience enough at that particular moment, and so on and so on. Actually, this is much more wasteful. To explode with anger is wasting your time. So, if you are born, <laughs> sorry, if you are waking up, <laughs> you can say if you are born, <laughs> because every morning we are born again. So, if you are waking up with the idea, I don't have enough time, just remove that thought and all the anxiety will melt. And then go doing things one by one with full attention. And you will save a lot of time. And suddenly you will have more time. And also, doing a task list is ex extremely important. Not because, you know, I don't know, it is a good practice or because, not even because you're going to forget something. It is because by writing down your task list, you are releasing resources in your brain that are worrying that you are going to forget something. You are probably not going to forget anything important. But if you worry that you are using 
lot of your mental resources. Okay? It is just like when you, on your computer, start some heavy task. Or maybe you opened too many applications in your mobile phone, in your smartphone, or in your computer. Suddenly, things get sluggish. If you have thousand programs and screens and tabs in your browser, things tend to be slow because you are using a lot of resources. By worrying that you don't have enough, enough time, that you're going to forget something, by doing a pity party, because poor little me, I don't have enough time for myself, you are consuming your own resources, your own in computer jargon, CPU, so processor uh, resources, and also memory resources, and also body resources, because in your mind you need to be on several places at once, and so on, and so on. Just focus your attention to think that is right in front of you. And suddenly you will have less errors that you need to, earlier you needed to fix, that means more time, and it will be better, it will be done in a better way, and you will suddenly have more time. You create the experience of not having enough time by believing that you don't have enough time. And this is a seed of what we are going to talk about in much more details from the next chapter forward how our beliefs shape our reality. And let me give you a spoiler right away. 100%. Your beliefs shape your reality in 100%. But in order to be able to use that insight, you need to be able to realize, to know deep in your bones, to know that you are witnessing all of that. <laughs> you are not inside that drama. You are observer of that drama, your true nature. And, you know, then you can direct it. You can not only tweak a little bit your reality, but actually kind of create it from, from the scratch up. Otherwise, you are the living proof of what John Lennon <laughs> told us <laughs> when he said, life is what happens to you while you are busy making other plans. And that's exactly what it is. You are preparing a breakfast for your kids and thinking about that meeting that you will have in your office in two hours. Then while in the office you are not present at that meeting, you are thinking about that email you need to send. And while you are sending an email, you are fantasizing about a vacation that you would like to go. And then, when you are eating your lunch, you are not really enjoying it. You, many people have no idea of what they had for lunch yesterday. Because it's just something that you do automatically by thinking what you are going to cook for a dinner. Your mind is always one step behind, or in front of what's going on, or behind. You can uh, dwell about the yesterday, and have regrets, and have nostalgia, and so on. Or you can be anxious about what's going to happen. And you are not present, and by that you are wasting your time. You waste your time because you believe that you waste your time. <laughs> that you don't have enough time to waste. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Okay. And from perspective of observer, everything gets easier. So, for example, you woke up in the morning and that thought, I must go to work, it's creating certain frustration, right? So, of course, resistance and so on. Why frustration? Frustration is when you believe that you don't have a choice, that you are somehow forced to do something that you do not prefer. But you do have a choice. By thinking, I must go to work now, and that's frustrating, you're ignoring the alternative. 
you can not go to work. But then I will get fired. Yes, then you will get fired. <laughs> but you have a choice. You can go to work and you already know where that road leads. And you cannot go to work and sure, get fired. And that option of not going to work is bundled with the circumstance of getting fired. But you do have a choice. You can go, you can. Never mind that from your present perspective, this option number B, I'm not I'm going to stay at home and get fired, seems unacceptable. It is a valid choice. You choose to go to work because you need that money. And that's fine. But you choose to go because you are getting something out of it. Maybe it's money, maybe it's social status, whatever it is. Never mind. So there is no need for frustration. But you need to be able first to pull out of the drama and to analyze the situation a little bit from bird eye view. You know, do I really not have a choice? And no, you do have a choice. You just choose to be well, going to go to work and because whatever. And maybe some circumstances is not up to your taste. So what? Accept it and then you can deal with that. Then work with it, not against it. You know, in any scenario, you have three viable choices. Whatever happens, you can accept it, you can change it, or you can leave the situation. Okay? And maybe not in every situation all three options are viable. So, for example, when you, if you don't like your boss, leaving your situation will means to get, you know, to quit your job, and maybe that's, that's something you prefer. Can you change that? You can't. Then accept it. Everything else is madness. By complaining how you wish that things are different, you're just creating anxiety and anger and desire and apathy and guilt and shame and so on. You can, if you, if you, but first you try to change it. If you can't change it, can you accept it? If you can't accept it, then leave it. Leave the situation. You know, everything else is pure madness. So maybe some circumstances not up to your taste. So what? So that lunch is not that tasty. So what? And you've been offered a promotion, but what if I fail? Okay, so you will fail. So what? You will learn something from you. So, you. I will fail is a terrible if you are identified with your emotions, with your thoughts, with your body, with your social status, if you have attachments to, towards money, towards whatever. But from the point of observer, okay, that wasn't my way, that wasn't, I wasn't happy right now. You know? And a lot of people think that it is somehow irresponsible to leave the job that they really hate because their family you know, needs that money and so it is irresponsible to leave the something that is bringing food to the table. But really, if you are coming home angry, if you are never at home because you are always at work, if you are cranky, you are not helping your family. It's actually more responsible to leave the job that you hate and it makes you come to your home on a daily basis. I mean, from time to time, of course, everybody. But on a daily basis, if you are unavailable for your family, that's even worse. So find an alternative. Nobody is saying, you know, quit your job right now and go somewhere else. Take your time, find an alternative. Think about what you really want to do. Find your meaning and find your purpose. And Actually, we are going to talk a lot about that in the, uh, in the next chapters. But for now, this is really important. And it is, you need to be able to be a neutral observer of all that. That will give you power. When you are in the point of view, when you are not identified with your name, with your 
family heritage, with your social status, with your reputation, and then with your body, with your body sensations, and with your emotions. When you really know that what you really is, is an observer, is a witness, is awareness, it's a consciousness, then you can mold even circumstances. We'll talk about that later. There is a brilliant Zen story that illustrates that point. So, at some point, some lady comes to Zen master, old wise man, and she needs help because she can't sleep for several months. She's having real trouble sleeping because she has a recurring nightmare of some snakes coming into her dreams. So, you know, she is afraid to go to sleep because she's afraid that she will see that, that snakes in the dream. And when the snakes appear, she suddenly wakes up and she's not sleeping and she's, you know, <laughs> half crazy. <laughs> she says, Look, lady, I understand. But you know what? I don't have much time and you're not giving me much to go on. I need to know the details. So please go home and go to sleep. And please notice how many snakes are there. I mean, five or seven, it's not the same. How long are they? How big are they? Uh, do they have stripes? What color are they? What are they doing? Are they hissing? Are they moving? So please, take all the details, remember all that is to them, and then, of course, come back and maybe I will be able to help you. And lady leaves. And after six months, he meets her in somewhere. And they greet, and he says, oh, what about your snakes? Ah, never mind, they're gone. Do you understand the trick that he pulled on her? So, one day, maybe six months ago, how that happened? Uh, six months ago, maybe she went to sleep, and for some reason, she was dreaming some snakes. And since she's afraid of the snakes, she woke up and then probably tried to go back to sleep thinking, oh my god, please don't just let me dream of that snakes. And she carried that intention of not seeing the snakes, that anxiety of seeing snakes into her dream state, and of course the snakes were back. And the next night she probably was afraid, oh, please just, I don't want that snakes. I don't. But when you say in your mind, when you think about not seeing something, not seeing, what are you doing? <laughs> seeing the, I mean, when I say, whatever you do, please now just don't think of pink alligator. What are you thinking about? Pink alligator. <laughs> However, the stupid <laughs> is, when you say, I don't want to see dead snakes in my dreams, she's setting her up for a trap. And when snakes appear, she's afraid and she suddenly wakes up because she's identified with that well, creature, with, with that herself in a dream, that is not only afraid of the snakes, but in the life-threatening situation because of those snakes. But now, he tells her, go there and witness the snakes. Tell me all the details. <laughs> How many are there? <laughs> what color? What number? Big head, small head, thieves, no thieves, <laughs> poisons, non poisons, what are they doing? <laughs> and now she's entering a dream state with the intention of exploration. It's not about, please don't, I don't want to see that snakes in my dream. It's about, hmm, let me see. I even hope that snakes are going to come back because I need to explore that situation. And now she is going into the, her dream state without anxiety. Actually, with some maybe even well, willingness at definitely acceptance. So she is accepting the situation. And she needs to analyze it. It's level of reason. We need to analyze that situation. And then snakes don't come back because snakes are a reflection of your uh, fears. She was probably afraid of the snakes. If she were afraid of something else more than snakes, you would probably see that. But never mind that. 
She sees snakes because it is a subconsciously reflection of some of her fears. But when she faces that fears, <laughs> you know, then it's not so, it's not trouble at all. And snakes disappeared. And this is exactly how it is in a real life. Because our life here, our physical reality, is uh, like a dream in more, in more ways that you could possibly imagine. And we'll talk about it also later. But from now on, from this point, your thoughts, your vibration actually, your vibration creates your thoughts, your emotions. Your vibration is what creates all those sensations and you always manifest in your life circumstances and thoughts and ideas that are consistent with your current vibration. And it, it, it is all that you are going to talk, we are going to talk about from the next chapter forward. But from, for now, we need very, very important tool. And that tool is detachment. Detachment from our thoughts. Knowingness that we are not that thoughts. Knowingness that we are not that emotion. You know, we need to detach from the idea <laughs> that we are our thoughts, we are our emotions, and we are somehow going to be hurt. Because real you is not going to be hurt. It cannot be hurt. Your consciousness, as we will see later, from the point of physics, not from the experiential point of view, like, like, like from the point of view, your consciousness just is. It is, it has no beginning, it has no end, because it lives outside of this reality, quote unquote, that is based in time and space, three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. It is beyond that. And it is an observer, or to be more precise, the experiencer of it all. But you need to be able to zoom out. Zoom out a little bit and take a point of observer in order to be a director. And once you understand that, you can also use negative, well, let's say, Circumstances that you do not prefer. We can call them negative if you wish for now, but we'll see later that it is not that simple. But circumstances that you do not prefer, that brings you into vibration that you do not like, as a teaching tool. So, for example, something or someone is making you angry. Maybe your husband never puts the toilet seat down. Or maybe your husband leaves his socks everywhere. Or maybe your wife does this and does that, and your son is doing this, and your son is doing that, and so on, and so on. And your boss, and your neighbors, and colleagues, and so on. So you notice, this is a critical step, you first need to notice that that person, that situation, is making you angry. And then, hmm, that's an interesting sensation. Look, when I am angry, there's a certain movement here in the area of my stomach. And, you know, maybe it's my fingers are tingling and I have angry thoughts. And you know what? I don't like that. What's making me angry? What makes me angry is that my husband leaves socks everywhere. Now, you can accept that, change that, or leave the situation. Leaving the situation would be ask for a divorce. That's a little bit too, too radical. <laughs> okay, so nothing about it. Can you change it? If you can't change it, accept it. Let's first try to change it. But first, you need to notice that that makes you angry. And then you go to zoom in a little bit. Why? I know that has something to do with my attachments and my resistances, but what exactly? What is my unfulfilled desire? What am I attached to? Maybe I'm attached to the idea that I want my husband to be more careful because that is collecting his socks all around the house is somehow eating my energy or my uh, I don't know, time. I don't have time for that. And I really want him to be more helpful. I don't want him to leave socks 
Great! Tell him that. But not from the vibration of anger. If you go from the vibration of anger, why do you leave us? I'm sorry. He will immediately, probably, if he is not conscious enough and aware enough, accept that vibration and attack you with something that makes him angry. Oh yeah, and what about yesterday's lunch? I told you I don't like garlic, but you put garlic inside anywhere all the time. And that's not going to solve anything. But once you realize that you can choose another vibration. You know, darling, it kind of bothers me that you are leaving your socks everywhere. Can we somehow solve that? Can we put a basket just for your socks right here? And it will be really easy for you to put them inside. Or just do me a favor, really, I, I, I really need more help from you. And that small token of appreciation that's called leaving your sockets in a basket where laundry is, it would really help me a lot. Take it from love. Take it from acceptance. Because you're not angry. Because you understand that he doesn't care. He, he didn't even notice. He just dropped his socks. You are the one who is choosing, choosing to get angry about it. But once you realize that, you can say, you know what, I don't want that. And once you say, I don't want that, you can choose that, you can choose your vibration, and learn a little bit about yourself. Because now you will suddenly realize that what makes you angry when he leaves his sock is because he is giving you more job, more to do than you already have enough to do, and you believe that you don't have enough time, and now you are in control. Aha! My anger of him leaving home socks comes from my feeling that I don't have enough time. My thoughts that I don't have enough time. My desire to have more time. And now you can address that. Or if he is not. Uh, that <laughs> great in putting toilet seat back down. Maybe you feel uh, like invisible, uh, not respected enough. Maybe you, you think that it is unsanitary, whatever it is. Find out what makes it and then learn from it. And then you get to pick and choose what you're going to do. You can change it. But if your husband, for whatever reason, cannot or will not change on that particular point of your socks, you can always just accept it. Because you, leave, you see socks, you pick them up, you put them in the laundry, two seconds. Being angry about that, two hours. Being angry about that and then facing your husband from the vibration of anger, when he gets angry, that is seven days of hell. Okay. You know, <laughs> talking about hell. There is an excellent Zen story about uh, heaven and hell. <laughs> it talks about uh, one great warrior, samurai. Great warrior coming to Zen master with his sword, his katana, his samurai sword. And he comes to the old man and says, You old man! The old man looks at him. Tell me one thing. Is there heaven and hell? And the old man looks at him and tells him, <laughs> I should explain to you if there is heaven. You are not going to understand it anyway. I mean, you're just a stupid soldier. Why should I discuss even these things with you? And you know, Samurai was a little bit angry and he grabbed the, his katana and he looked at the old man. And the old man said, ha, you are threatening me with that knife. Oh, come on, with that knife. It is so dull you couldn't even cut bread. And now the samurai is really, you know, angry, he's insulted, he pulls out his sword, he, he goes to the old man, and the old man says, that's hell. And the samurai stops himself and realizes that he just received an answer to his question and actually is quite impressed because that old man just risked his life to teach him something. I mean, the old man couldn't have known if he's going to strike him down. So he risked his life to teach him a lesson. And 
you know, that's really filled him with appreciation and gratitude and wisdom and courage of that old man. So he puts his sword back and takes a deep bow with the full respect. And the old man says, and that's heaven. So heaven and hell do exist. And they are here and you are creating it. You can live your heaven right here. And it is all about you. It is all about your attachments, your resistances, as you will see later, your beliefs, your definitions. But we'll talk about that from the next chapter forward. But for now on, this is crucial. You need to zoom out a little bit. And when you zoom out and you know that you're experiencer of all that, even the worst possible circumstances become a teaching tool for yourself that will help you to remove from your life what you are not. And when you remove from your life what you are not, joy flows from yourself and there is a sense of meaning and there is a sense of purpose and we are, we are coming to that. We are coming to real answers. But first, you need to understand that even negative circumstances, things that are really bothering us, that makes us angry, people that makes us angry are just a teaching tool if you choose to perceive them that way. Exactly as Jung said, Everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves. But now, of course, you can say, yeah, sure, <laughs> that's great, that's perfect, I understand all that. But how to remind yourself to leave the perspective of an actor in a drama and pull out to the perspective of observer or director? Because when something makes me angry, I am in full angry mode. I suddenly have angry thoughts and angry, angry perception, and therefore I, I don't perceive my angriness until it's too late. How to be somehow constantly aware that all those things that are going on that look so real and so vivid are just something that I am observing and participating in, definitely, but not exactly what I am. And Buddha told us that in his fourth noble truth. He talks about eightfold path, you know, you know, right views, right intention, and so on. Or, to be more precise, to be more succinct, he talks about meditation and the way of life that is consistent with it, that doesn't bring harm to yourself or to others. You know. And with meditation, there is so much misconceptions, especially here in the Western civilization. You can read from all the different sources that meditation is great, stress relief, and you know it lowers your blood pressure, and it's healthy for you, and so on and so on. And that's all kind of true. But these are secondary uh, effects that comes from understanding. They all come from understanding that you are the witness of all that, not being sucked into a drama. But in order to live your life from the point of observer, you need a constant daily reminder. And that reminder is called meditation. What you do actually in the meditation is you sit quietly for, let's say, 15 minutes a day observing your thoughts, observing your sensations, observing your emotions, and actually accepting it. It is a training in radical acceptance, and it has nothing to do with mastering a technique. It has everything to do with accepting things as they are. Because you know they can't hurt you, real you. <laughs> you know, do you remember Gandhi's, no one can hurt me without my permission. 
That's exactly what he's talking about. Real you cannot be hurt. But of course, someone can hurt your feelings, someone can hurt your body, someone can even hurt your thoughts with some idea that you don't agree. Actually, you disagree completely. That's kind of hurting your thoughts. Or Gandhi put it, put it that way, like, I'm not going to allow uh, someone with dirty feet to walk through my mind. Uh, something like that. <laughs> but when you know that you are observer, and to know that you are observer of all that, you need a constant reminder. All of us need constant reminder. And reminder is that you sit quietly for 15 minutes and observe your train of thoughts. At first, it looks like this. You sit in the meditation cushion, and suddenly you need to itch, scratch. And then you decide that you're going to ignore that. Because it's just a body sensation. It's not you. It's not you who is itching. <laughs> it's just movement of your consciousness. It's a sensation. And you choose to analyze it. So you focus your attention on your itch, and actually, when you don't judge it, when you don't label it, when you have no resistance, I don't want that, when you have attachment to the idea that your body should be scratch free, <laughs> then that itch will just go away. And then you feel that you're nervous. And you focus your attention on that feeling, and it suddenly, it's not that unpleasant. What's making it really unpleasant, it's actually quite interesting, but what's making it unpleasant is your uh, resistance, because you don't want to feel that. And then some anxiety, you will notice some anxiety. You focus on that anxiety, you observe that anxiety, and that anxiety just melts down. And then thoughts are going to come. You cannot stop your thoughts. It takes a, quite a lot of training in meditation to be able to completely stop your uh, train of thoughts. But you know what? It doesn't matter. At least at first. So you observe your thoughts. Don't get attached to them. Because what's going to happen? First of all, let me be clear, you cannot stop your thoughts from coming in. In the same way as you cannot stop your anxiety and you cannot stop your body sensations. But when you observe them, you don't identify with them, they just disappear. So thought will come. Why are you sitting there? You have better things to do. Come on, get up. Get up. Come on. Uh, and you even feel nervous because now you need to get up, you need to go to work, you need to do something, you need to cook your dinner, you need to wash your dishes, you need to do something. Get up, get up, get up. Then you notice that thought and you thank that thought for that lovely suggestion and choose to ignore it. Yes, sure, in a 10 minutes, I'll get up. Then another thought will come up. You really think that's going to help you, that sitting? And you let that go. And from time to time, some thought will get you uh, your attention. And because it, now it depends on what type of character, what are your mental patterns, but your mind will find a thought pretty soon. Maybe not first day, but second. That will pull your attention out of meditation. Maybe it will serve you an uh, image of the beautiful um, garden, and you're walking among the butterflies, and then you're, you're fantasizing. Just notice that you're fantasizing and let go. Accept whatever is happening and let go. And then some car is going to be in front of your house doing a lot of noise. <laughs> Someone, some teenager is maybe testing his motorcycle and you will immediately get angry because now I want to meditate and I want everything to be peace and calm and I want a beautiful um, fragrance in the air and I want to see candles and you know because now I'm meditating and I'm holier than thou <laughs> and you are making me nervous, angry. It's not about the motorcycle, it's about you not accepting that situation, you have resistance toward the idea that someone is making noise when you are trying to make it, and you have attachment to the idea that now things should be perfect. It's not about creating perfect circumstances, it's not about mastering technique, it is actually training and radical acceptance. Whatever happens, accept it. And observe it. And in the beginning, 
it will be difficult. <laughs> Actually, in the beginning it will be hell, <laughs> maybe for some. <laughs> but in time, by observing your thoughts, by observing your emotions, your body sensations, you stop identifying with them. And pretty soon you will feel that time between uh, your, your getting angry, for example, and realizing that you are angry is going to get shorter and shorter. It's not going to be like miracle, you know, at the first second, after two days of meditation, someone will make you angry and you will notice, ah, look, I'm getting angry. I, feel, I see anger rising in me. It will, in time. But at first, you will get angry. But maybe after 20 minutes, maybe after 10, maybe after two hours, never mind, whatever it is, accept it. You will notice that you're angry and then, you get to choose your vibration, you get to you zoom out, you see the big picture. You cannot see the big picture while you're sitting in a frame. Now you see big picture, and big picture is that you have some attachment or some resistance. Then you zoom in. What really made me angry? What kind of attachment? What kind of resistance? Is it really true? And what can I do about that? And how can I fix the situation from higher level of consciousness. Because, as Einstein said, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. It's all about knowing that you are observer of all of it, and that will shift your percept perception in a really profound way. And when you sit in a meditation, you just let your thoughts come and go without getting attached to them. Or, as one of the greatest Zen masters said, he, this is actually a recipe for meditation that is extremely profound and easy to understand, and it's one of my favorites. And he said, Leave your front door and your back door open. Let thoughts come and go. Just don't serve them tea. So thoughts will come, and one will say, You need to get up, and the other will say, your wife doesn't love you. And the third one will say, you're a total failure at your job. And that's that negative self-talk that you hear all about. Just accept it, because you are now better than that. You now understand that you should not believe your thoughts. Your thoughts are just a reflection of a vibratory state that you're already in. And if you really just observe them neutrally, you understand that you are in control, and these thoughts, and these emotions, and these body sensations are pointing you in the direction of the things that are not aligned with your true self, with your true nature. And you will see all the mind patterns that you created during the well, <laughs> years of your existence, that are, some of them are of course, useful and great, and some of them are simply stupid. And you don't know where did you get that idea. Why are you reacting? You will see that for years you've been living on an autopilot. You acted from the point of non-awareness. You acted automatically based on some previous experiences and uh, mind patterns and emotions that are stored who know where, and that just doesn't serve you. Actually, what, what they, are, they are doing, they are locking you in a vibration that you do not prefer, and then you can change them. And another extraordinary thing will happen. Once you realize that you are reacting, more than you actually believe that you do, from the point of non-awareness, <laughs> unenlightened point of view, from the lower vibrations that you don't prefer. And you've been doing it for years. Just because of your attachments and your ignorance, now you will have much more empathy to other people who are doing the same thing. So next time when your boss bursts into your office and yells at you because you're all lazy, we should do more and we should be richer and how come that our competition can steal our clients and he's really angry. You understand that 
he has his own attachments and resistances and he too would like a better social status in the uh, eyes of his superiors and he has desire to create make more money because he is afraid that he will lose his job and if he loses his job he will be ashamed and guilty and he doesn't want that and you know what <laughs> you have been exactly the same. Maybe not in the same uh, way, maybe the circumstances were a little bit different, you were attached to some other things that uh, he is not, and you wouldn't yell at your employees, but you did, did just different kind of well, stupid things. <laughs> so you understand, and you have empathy, and you can offer your perspective you can you can if you think that he is ready you can even send him a link to this course maybe but if you have any kind of expectation that he should do this or should do that and that you need to make him better person and he needs to be better person because of this because of that you miss the point. You are creating more suffering for yourself because now you're attached to the idea that he should change. And actually, he is suffering. And he will suffer until he realizes that suffering is completely unnecessary, but he needs to realize that by himself. You can offer your perspective, you can uh, but first, you need to be kind, at least at the level of acceptance. Yes, I understand you are angry and I understand that your boss wants you to make more money and maybe you have enough pride because this year we did better than and you don't want to lose that pride because if you lose that pride, you will jump to the level of shame and be guilty and be afraid and so And I understand once you accept, you start to accept yourself, you will start to accept others. And then you will love yourself and you will love others. You know, not in a romantic way, but love is, love is the, you know, when you approach people without judgment, then love just naturally flows. And then you can use that high vibratory state to be thyself. So first you know thyself and then you be thyself. And from that point, joy, meaning and purpose will just flow naturally. And once again, I really need to quote Jung because he's really genius. He <laughs> was really brilliant mind and he said your vision will become clear only when you can look into your own heart who looks outside dreams who looks inside awakes when you stop identifying with your thoughts with your body with your emotions with your perceptions and you really know that you are beyond all that that you are natural observer of all that you will see that life doesn't happen to you. You are not a victim. Life happens through you. What you call happy life. Experience of happy life, not circumstance of happy life, right? We solved that in the beginning of this chapter. When you say happy life, you mean experience. And experience is about consciousness. Your consciousness creates your reality and is natural observer of your thoughts and emotions and body sensations. And you know what? If you want to be happy, be. <laughs> Just be. Get it? <laughs> this sentence works on several layers. If you want to be happy, just be. To be able to do that, you need to meditate at least 15 minutes a day. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> but that's the truth. My spiritual teacher, one of my favorites, used to say that there is a one person in a million that is aware of his true nature and all of that without any training. One in a million. But you know what? I have yet to meet that one. <laughs> you need to sit 15 minutes a day to detach, to get a distance, just a tiny little bit. You know, you need half a second between trigger that will make you angry or afraid or guilty and realizing that, aha, uh -huh, this is not what I am. This is Because if you don't have that distance, that, that delay, vibration will just suck you in. And you will be angry and you will be afraid and you will be full of desires and you will be guilty and you will be ashamed. And then, you know, you, you need to wait till you are calm enough to get to the point when suddenly there is a thought, wait a minute, what am I doing? Why am I really angry or afraid? What am I attached to? Okay. <laughs> what am I rejecting? What am I clinging to? What are my desires? And when you, when you get to that point, you will see that just by being, you Flow, your purpose, your joy flows naturally. And you know what? This is exactly the opposite of what we've been told, in, especially in the Western civilization. You need no pain, no gain. You need to work everything. You need to build yourself up. No, you don't. You need to find out what you already are and then be that. And then and that means living with Less, okay? Perfect, in perfect world, you will live without any resistances, meaning that you would accept everything and go with the flow. And, but for starters, let's just say that you need to remove major obstacles, major resistances. Then you will get to the point when you're going to, to fine tuning, and then you will see that just by being yourself, it takes no effort at all. You will be happier and more successful. But, you know, before we come to the how to do that, because this approach definitely works. And it is perfect for people who are well, mind-oriented. But it doesn't work for everyone. The recipe that we are going to give you from the next chapter forward is much more intuitive, it's much more easier to implement or to follow, but, and let me be perfectly clear here, it doesn't work. It works 10% of efficiency if you do not have your daily meditation practice. You should sit in meditation for 15 minutes every day, unless you're too busy. Then you should sit for an hour. Practice of observing what is and accepting it. Your thoughts, your emotions, your body sensations, your perceptions, things that are going around you, sounds. Just observe them without attachment. That training will help you to detach, to get healthy distance from your thoughts, from your emotions, from your body sensations that you really need if you are going to debug your own mind. Find mind patterns that you do not prefer and just remove them.